Hi everyone, welcome to Audit and Assurance. Today we are going to look at uh, the audit risk. We are doing a revision, guys. So if you are preparing uh, your exams for audit, guys, you need uh, this, um, re this revision. So guys, I just wrote some points here uh, that you have to know. I'm going to explain um, everything here. So, but before I do that, let me just take you back. So guys, on audits, uh, this is what you have to understand. What do we say now? Um, we say um, the company is owned by the shareholders. The shareholders are the owners of the company. But guys, they do appoint people. So I'm doing this so that you'll be able to understand. Then we'll look into the audit risk. So I'm doing this so that you'll be able to understand what audit risk is, what uh, the audit risk and what are the audit response. So this is a way of making it easy, making the life easier for you. Step by step, baby steps, you surely get there, right? So the company is owned by the shareholders, but the shareholders now, they do appoint people who run a company on their behalf. And those people, what do we call them? What do we call them? Obviously, it is the directors. But now, if you did now corporate governance, we said, the type of directors that are hired by the shareholders to run the company on their behalf, they are known as what? They are known as the executive directors. So the executive directors are hired by the shareholders to run the company on their behalf. So guys, they have the managerial responsibility to run the company. They run the company on behalf of the shareholders. So guys, the executive directors, we need them. These are the people that are qualified. These are the people that have the experience, that have the expertise. So they do run the company on behalf of the shareholders. So guys, their responsibility is to run the company in number years. But what you have to understand is these directors, they also what? Yes, they also prepare the what? The financial statements. Allow me to shorten that this. FS is for the financial statements. So they prepare the financial statements. So now the directors, they do prepare the financial statements. Yes, and what do we expect? We expect that they do this following the standards, following the what the international accounting standards, following the international financial reporting standards, right? They have to follow the standards, guys, when they prepare what the financial statements. But guys, we are afraid that when they prepare the financial statements, we are afraid that the um, the financial statements can be what can be misstated. These are the financial statements. We don't want them to be misstated. What do we mean uh, by misstatement? It can be due to error, it can be due to fraud, or maybe they didn't follow like the rules and the standards. So guys, we want the financial statements of the company to show a true and fair view. In other words, now when we're doing audit, yes, we can use true and fair view, or we can say in, in order to ensure that the financial statements were prepared in all material respects in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. You follow right. So what are we saying here? We are saying we want to ensure that the financial statements were prepared in all material respects. When I look at the word material, material was we are talking about things that do have a value. So we are saying when the when the, the directors are preparing the financial statements, they have to follow the standards and they have to consider everything that has a value and make sure that they have recorded those items correctly. Because when you look at things that do have value, like on the materiality, things that are material. So when they misstate things that are material, when they misstate things that do have a significant value, when they make an error, or maybe there was fraud, as long as it is material, as long as it has a significant value, we will now then say the financial statements are materially misstated. And on that case, you can't express an opinion saying that what they did was true and fair. You follow right. So guys, looking at this now, the directors, they prepared the financial statements. But how do we know that what they did was correct? How do we know that? So we have to hire people who are independent. We have to hire people who do not any, have any relationship with the, what the directors. So because guys, we, are, we want to hire people who will audit what has been prepared by these directors. So the shareholders, they will hire what, what uh, they will hire the external, the external auditors. And the external auditors, we are saying they must be, 
they must be independent of the company because now when they when you hire the auditors they will audit the financial statements you hire in ex the external auditors you hire these are we call them the practitioners people who have a profession so we hire a firm that will audit this company but they will send a team maybe they will, they will send a team to, to to deal with this company but now what you have to understand the team those people that they sent they must be independent of the directors. They must not have any relationship with the directors. Imagine you work uh, from the audit firm, then uh, you, you have been sent to audit the financial statements prepared by the directors. And then you discover that one of the directors who has prepared the books is your friend. Obviously, in this case, in that case, you won't be able to do it um, independently you follow so if you are not independent you must not be part of the team so we are hiring people we will send the people that are independent of the directors then they will want then the, the responsibility of the auditor now so as the, the auditor now they must be independent yes and what you have to know is they audit the what they audit the financial statements and when they audit the financial statements what do they do guys uh, we have to know that the auditors they will prepare a report they will do the work yes they can do an interim audit they can do now the final audit but at the end guys they will prepare a final audit which will show the work that they've done yes so that uh, audit report at the end they will express an opinion yes so the auditor is to express an opinion so guys what are we saying now when we say they express an opinion this is a conclusion that they give they are which you are which talks about the way that has been performed by the directors so they express an, op an opinion on whether the financial statements or shows a true and fair view or we say on whether the financial statements were prepared in all material respects in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework you follow right so when they express an opinion guys the report is being sent to whom to the shareholders like they they, 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 they are reporting what they have what what they have audited here but what you have to understand is so the shareholders will trust what these auditors will say because these auditors they have a profession they are qualified and they are independent. So the auditors, if they see the books are showing a trend fair view, that's when the shareholders will trust what has been done. Or if they say they are not showing a trend fair view, they will still believe what they are saying. So in other words, when they express an opinion, in other words, we are also saying that they are going to give uh, what is known as the reasonable what the reasonable assurance. So they'll give the reasonable assurance to these shareholders. Guys, the financial statements of a company, it is not only the shareholders who wants to look at the financial statements. We also have different users, guys, who wants to know the financial statements of the company. We do have the tax authorities, guys, in terms of the profit or loss. They need to know the profit that was made by the company and collect their tax. We do have the, the finance providers, the banks, so they don't just give you money. They look at your financial statements. But for them to trust, guys, uh, we need the books that have been audited, that have been audited by the auditors, which will enhance um, the, the, the credibility of the financial statements. You follow, right? Now, guys are looking at this now. So when the auditors audit the financial statements here, we do not want the audit risk. So now when they audit the financial statements, they can be in what an audit risk. What is audit risk now? Guys, audit risk now, what are we saying? When they audit, they can be audit risk. Imagine you are the auditor. Then you look uh, at the financial statements or then you just think that everything is okay, but things are not okay. You understand? For example, someone might think that what has been done by the directors is correct, but now, uh, but we are saying what has been done, it was not correct, but you didn't, um, there are some of the things that you did miss. Are you saying this is a risk now? Why am I saying it's a risk? Because, for example, if you think that the books are correct, yet they are not correct, the risk is, on, is going to affect the opinion that you are going to express. You might say, ah, the books are true and fair, but yet they are not true and fair. You understand the risk is going to affect the risk is on the opinion that you are going to express the books are okay yet they are not okay so there can be a risk you follow now what is the audit risk now audit risk this is the risk that the auditor expresses an inappropriate audit opinion when the financial statements are materially misstated you understand is the risk that the auditor expresses an inappropriate 
audit opinion. Like the opinion that you express, it can be inappropriate when the financial statements are what? When they are what? When they are materially, materially what? Misstated. Right, you follow. When they are materially misstated. You might think that the books are okay, but yet they are materially misstated. Materially, guys, material, things that do have value, misstated. Things that have value, they've been misstated, and you have not, you have not yet noticed as an auditor. So that's an audit risk, you understand? On the audit risk, guys, we do have the detection risk, we do have uh, the inherent risk, we do have uh, the control risk, you understand? Right, so guys, the, these are the risks that you can face. So I have given you some examples. Uh, in the exam, guys, when you answer in the exam, what you have to know is, uh, before you read the scenario, in your mind, you must know the audit risk. For example, before you read the scenario, if there is loan in the scenario, loan is an audit risk. Why do I say so? I'm going to explain. If we are auditing um, a new client, it's an audit risk, you understand? Before you read the scenario, you must Re, you must know the audit risk. You understand? Number one, number one risk. Yes, sir. So obviously, what you are going to do in the exam is you are going to prepare a what a T account. Obviously, um, on the left side there will be the what the audit risk. On the right side there will be the auditor's what response. This is what I want you to understand, guys. So. How do you answer this in the exam? Obviously, you have your, your, your word. How do you answer this? If you identify correctly, if you identify correctly, you will get 0 0.5 mark. You understand? If you identify from the scenario that this is an audit risk, if it is a risk for sure, you get 0 0.5. So you, you identify. Identifying is just copying as it is. You can copy as it is. The company is auditing this client for the first time. Or you are saying we are auditing a new client. You can copy it. It's is even fine. Or let's say the development cost has been capitalized. You have identified that 0 0.5. You write as it is. It's fine. You then explain why you are saying it's a risk. So if you explain correctly, you get another 0 0.5. If you explain correctly, if you prove that this is an audit risk, you get the 0 0.5. You get it. Now, but on explaining, I want to guide you on this one. On explaining, on explaining, guys, you know the statement of financial position. I'm going to give you the example of financial position. We have the non current assets, right? Uh, non current assets, guys, with PPE, with intangible assets, um, current assets, with the inventory, the trade receivables, the cash, ETC, right, with the equity here, with um, liabilities, right? Now, for you to get another 0 0.5 on explaining, you have to tell us that the risk. That are uh, like, they remember the auditor will think that things are okay, right? Yet they are not okay. What is the risk now? So don't just say like, uh, this is going to affect the non-current assets. If you are not specific, you won't get this mark. They will say it's a scattergun approach. You have to be specific. Like as the auditor, you are saying this is a risk. Like... Uh, this risk is it on the inventory? Be specific. Don't just say assets. If you say assets, look at these assets. This type of risk is it going to affect the inventory or the receivables or the intangible assets? If you just say assets, you are not being specific. Or you just say non current assets, you are not being specific. If you say current assets, you are not being specific. You won't get a mark that scattergun approach. So you have to be specific. If it's going to affect the decision, it's going to affect the service receivables. Then on the response. Response now, what are we doing? You are talking about things that will reduce the, the risk that you have identified. If you explain correctly, you will get one mark. You understand? 
you get it. So if the question says, uh, tell us eight audit risk, for example, in the final, just know that eight will be how many marks? 16 marks. So you need eight, eight, you get it. So guys, if you explain correctly, you get another mark. It is not about quantity, guys, when you are giving a response. It's about quality. What are you saying? What you are saying, is it going to reduce the risk? That's what you must know. Right, let's look at this uh, now. These are the risks, for example. So in the example, if you are reading this scenario, if they say this is a new client, so this, this it's an audit risk. Imagine um, you saw someone for the first time, uh, you are seeing someone for this first time, guys. I want you to understand, understand this, guys. New clients, just imagine. <coughs> you, you saw someone for the first time. Uh, imagine you saw someone for the first time, never met that person before. <coughs> you might, uh, the way you might judge incorrectly, so, for example, let's say, is this person a good person? Or maybe is he talkative or not? Your judgment can be wrong because you don't know you that much about that person. You don't have much information. So the fact that you might give a wrong judgment makes it a risk, you understand? So the same, extending the idea now, the same applies to an organization. You want to audit this client for the first time. That's an audit risk. But you have to be careful on the new client because some they will say, uh, we, have, um, we now have a new audit senior. Guys, um, when you're doing audits, your company is the audit what firm. So if they say we have a new audit senior, read the question carefully. If it's a new senior, we haven't hired a, a client. You understand? So it's not an audit risk. But if they say the client is new, or we are planning the audit for the first time. If they say we are planning the audit for the first time, it means he's, he's our new client, right? So new client, um, extending the idea, imagine now we want to audit this client for the first time. We don't have much information about that company. You understand? So there's a risk that um, we can give a wrong opinion. Applying my example, you can give a wrong opinion about that client. So that's an audit risk. So what will you say on audit risk here? So this, uh, this company is a new client. And uh, the fact that you've identified, it's not about quantity, but quality. If you identify that it's a new client, it's, it's, if it's a new client, you get 0 0.5. On the explanation, why are we saying it's an audit risk? Guys, the new client, if, if we have a new client, the risk is on um, us, um, uh, we lack cumulative knowledge audit knowledge, not just any knowledge, there's lack, there's lack of cumulative audit knowledge of the client, which will increase the, de the detection risk. That's it. Then you get another 0 0.5. Or you can talk about the opening balances, guys, if you want. So guys, you, you can talk about opening balances because we didn't audit that camera last year. It's new. So the opening balance that you can get from that client may be misstated. You understand? And you might not know it, right? So it, it can be misstated. That's an odd risk. Now on the response, guys, you don't just give any response. You respond to what you have said here. If you have, if you have, if you have explained about lack of cumulative word knowledge about the client, um, there's lack of cumulative word knowledge. So guys, if you don't know much about the client, what do you do? We need more time. Just think of uh, someone new to you. For you to know that person, you need more time. You understand? So we say more time um, is needed, right? More time and resources should be devoted to. That's what we're saying. Say so more time and resources should be devoted to in order to understand uh, the entity in this environment. And you talk also about the substantive procedures. Substantive procedures, guys, you say more substantive procedures should be what? Should be performed. Yes. New client. Then number two, number two, refurbishing cost. So guys, when they talk, when we talk about the refurbishing cost, these are the costs that, that you are just incurring, right? Why is it a risk? If they mention about the refurbishment costs in the exam, it's an audit risk. Why is that so? Uh, identifying 0 0.5, explaining on the refurbishment cost, guys, these are just costs. Now, on, on the organization, guys, do you know that there are some costs that are expensed and there are costs that are capitalized? You understand? So, guys, uh, we do have assets, right? We do have expenses, right? You understand? So the type of cost that you incur, uh, remember, taking you back now to IS-15, we say an asset is a resource that increases uh, economic benefits, right? You understand? 
That's an asset. Yes, an asset is a result that is controlled by an entity as a result of past events, out of which future economic benefits are expected to flow. Um, out of which future economic benefits are expected to flow into the entity, right? So if we expect to benefit, then we say we have an asset. So if, when a company incurs costs, if that cost is going to increase our benefits, therefore it's an what? It's an asset. But if if the cost is not going to increase the benefits, it's an what? It's an expense. You understand? So on the refurbishment cost, if they incur the refurbishment cost, we don't know whether uh, they are going to classify it correctly in terms of the expense or assets. So the risk that's that's why I was saying it's a good risk. Your explanation will be uh, there's a risk that revenue expenditures may be treated as capital expenditure, which will result in overstating what the PPE. Revenue expenditure, these are just expenses. If they are treated as assets instead of expenses, they will overstate the, the what? The PPE. When you talk about the audit risk, tell us what is going to affect, what is it going to affect? Is it going to affect PPE, tangible inventory, receivable cash, or what? You understand? So we are saying um, um, if the revenue expenditure is treated as capital expenditure or vice versa, right? If revenue expenditure is treated as capital expenditure, they overstate the PPE. You get it. Or if the capital expenditure was treated as, uh, as a revenue expenditure, if you treat it in a vice versa way, it's either it's going to overstate this or it's going to overstate the uh, expenses, right? Right. So that's it, guys. Uh, what about the response that you can give? The response you can give just to the examiner that review the breakdown of the cost. Review the breakdown of the cost. Then you say if it meets uh, if it meets the capital that same criteria, it must be included in PPE according to IS 16. If it doesn't meet the capital assessment criteria, it must be expensed in the profit or loss. So that's what you should do. You understand? Review when when I'm giving about the cost, I have to review the breakdown of the cost to see if they qualify the capitalize if they don't do expense, right? The development cost capitalized. Guys, development costs are talking about the intangible assets, right? What do we do? What does the standard say? According to ice stated, guys, the development cost. You don't just capitalize the development costs. We capitalize if they meet the criteria, right? So on the development costs, this is what you have to understand. If they say they capitalize 0 0.5, on the explanation, you tell the examiner that. Guys, on the scenario, I'm saying that if they say they've capitalized, how do you know that it has met the criteria? So you tell the examiner that if the development cost uh, has not met the criteria but has been capitalized, there is a risk that the intangible assets. Are you seeing that I'm being specific? I didn't say the assets. The intangible assets will be what? Will be overstated. But I didn't say it will be over or under. There are some cases where you say over or under, where, where, where we say it's correct. But there are some cases if you say over or under, it's not correct, you won't get a mark. In that case, uh, we say it's scattergun approach. There are some of the things where you have to be specific. Like on this, on this number three, they've capitalized already. So the risk is on them overstating the intangible. Not saying over overstating the intangible or understating. If you say they can be understated, how can it be understated yet they've already included in the assets? If you say that, you won't get a mark. You fall right. So I say there's a risk that the development cost will be capitalized. So on the development cost capitalized, you're saying, uh, since they've been capitalized, if they are the cost that, that have met the criteria, there's a risk that the intangible assets are overstated. On the response, these are just cost guys, you say review the breakdown of the cost. Review the breakdown. And if for those costs that have met the criteria, they must be included under intangible assets according to estimated. For those that, that, that have met the criteria, they must be expensed, right? Now, if the customers are struggling to pay this, think of the customers. Customers is what is these are the receivables they have our money assent so it's, it's a risk so guys what you have to understand is we say when you're doing standards if the customers are struggling to pay debts if they are incoverable debts they should be, be removed from the receivables and if you are not if, if you are you are doubting your customers you increase your allowance and you reduce the receivables i think that the risk is on overstating the receivables but if you say it's all it can be overstated or understated in that case you're not so sure then you won't get a mark innocent so if the customers are struggling to pay debts, there's one explanation here that um, 
if they are irrecoverable deaths, they have to be, there's a risk that if they are irrecoverable deaths that have not been removed, the receivables may be overstated. You can talk about um, uh, allowance, uh, allowance for receivables. If the company has not increased the allowance, there's a risk that um, the, all the receivables may be, may, may be. It's also about the language, you understand? I didn't say the, the receivables have been, been overstated. Because we don't know what is actual located, you understand? So there is, there's a risk that they may be overstated. That's the correct um, uh, statement, right? That's the correct... Um, okay, the problem is on people failing to explain it correctly. You can't just say they have been overstated. How do you know they have been? On this case, we are saying they may be overstated. You get it? Right. The other thing, some employees, um, okay, if I give you the, the response, the response uh, when the customers are struggling, remember, we don't want to overstate our receivables. So how do you reduce the risk? I can say review the HD receivables listing to identify any um, long outstanding debts and ensure that they've been what? They've been reduced. You understand? So that, that, that's the, to ensure that the, the long outstanding debts uh, if they are any recoverable days, they are eaten off, you understand? Not only that, you can talk about the allowance. Guys, do you know that the allowance are just estimates, right? So you can say, um, um, on the allowance for receivables, do you discuss with the management? This is what most people do, most students do. They just say, discuss with the management. Discuss with the management. Discuss with them about what? If you read even the, the reports, the examiner reports, the, the examiners have been complaining about that. That's when they just say, discuss uh, with the management, discuss with management, always on the response. Discuss about what? Be specific, you understand, to get the mark. So now, discuss with the management on the allowance of receivable if there is a, a need to reduce uh, those allowances and uh, also assess the reasonableness of the assumptions that you've used. Are you seeing that? Right, now um, we have also some employees made redundant. Guys, on redundancy, we say this is when uh, someone is forced to leave the organization. And you know that the company must not uh, just fire the employees without a notice, right? So if you make a redundancy, obviously, it's likely that there will be liabilities. You have a liability as an organization. So you have to consider um, uh, uh, increasing your liabilities with the redundancy provision, right? So some employees being made redundant is a risk. Why? The risk is on the liabilities because maybe the directors might not increase the liabilities. So what is your explanation here? There is a risk that the liabilities may be what? Understated. If they do not what? Include the redundancy provision. But how do you reduce the risk? Remember, we don't want the, the liabilities to be understated, right? We don't want the liabilities to be understated. So how do you reduce that risk on the redundancy provision? You can discuss with the management about the issue of, uh, about the progress of the redundancy, you understand? And, in, and you have to ensure that they have recognized the redundancy provision in the financial streams. You get it. And also guys, um, even on the redundancy, it can be because you need to, to, to even recalculate the redundancy provision. Maybe the amount that was recorded was wrong. So now that, uh, response that you can do, yeah, you can give in order to reduce the, the risk. Yes. Sales continue to fall for more than two years. Guys, what I understand in business is yes, a company's profits can fall, but not revenue. If the sales continue to fall, if the sales continue to fall, guys, just imagine if the sales continue to fall. I'll end up, okay, I can give you an example. Let's say it's a college. A college yet, um, three years back, they had uh, 1,000 students two years back. They had 500 students uh, one year back. They, they had um, 50 students. This year, they now have uh, uh, five students. What do you think about that college? It's likely that they're going to, 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 to close that. Right? It's likely that uh, they, 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 they won't be able to operate in the foreseeable future. So if the sales continue to fall, guys, we will question their going concern. So if the sales continue to fall, it's an audit risk. Why is it an audit risk? What would the auditor think? What, what's the risk? Uh, like things that can cannot be identified by the auditor. It's about the going concern, right? So I say we, you know, we say that if the sales continue to fall, it's likely to affect the going concern status of the company. But that's not enough. What you have to understand in accounting is when a company is no longer a going concern, 
when a company is no longer going concern. The stakeholders have the right to know. Because just imagine someone who can invest in his or her money into a business, not knowing that you are no longer going to continue in the future. So this is not good. That's why we are required to disclose the status about the going concern. If you are no longer going concern, then we have to inform people that we, we are no longer going concern. We don't expect to continue to operate in the foreseeable future, but in the next 12 months, right? So the risk is on you not disclosing the status. So the auditor might not know that. You understand? The, so we, what are we saying? So if so, it's going to fall, your explanation will be, uh, you start by explaining the going concern, then you then be specific on the risk, right? There's a risk that the company will not be able to continue in the foreseeable future. The risk is on what? There's a risk that the, the going concern status may not be disclosed. That's the risk. They might not disclose that. Or we might say there's a risk that going concern disclosures may be inadequate. So how do you reduce the risk now? The auditor can review the company's uh, future cash flows, right? And also assess whether the company is still able to continue as a, a to continue in the foreseeable future, right? You understand? We also have uh, if the company is planning to list on the stock exchange. If a company and you are planning to list on the stock exchange, guys, imagine you want to be listed. Mm, you want to be listed on the stock exchange. Guys, on the stock exchange, that's when you also uh, attract the investors. So guys, imagine you want to you want to attract someone. <laughs> People they pretend. You understand what I'm saying? So they pretend as if things are, are, are okay, things are good, things are better in order to attract people. You, you understand? So I'm saying if you're planning to to, to list on, on stock exchange, there's a risk that the director will end up manipulating the financial statements, right? So it's a risk. Yes. What would be the explanation? There's a risk that the directors will manipulate the financial statements. That is what. Now, don't just say manipulating, then you say that's enough. Be specific. They will what? They will end up overstating, well, okay, we have the statement of financial concern, we have the statement of profit or loss, right? On the profit or loss, guys, we have the revenues and the, and the expenses. So when they are manipulating, what do they do on the assets? They will overstate the assets and the revenues. And on the, then they will understate the liabilities and they will understate the expenses. So that they will, they will appear that they, will, they are performing better. You understand? So that's the risk. So if the company is planning to list on the stock exchange, there's a risk that there's a risk that the company will overstate the revenues and the assets, and they will understate the expenses and the liabilities. And how do you reduce the auditor's risk? How do you reduce the risk, which is your auditor's response? Guys, if someone is now motivated to manipulate, how do you reduce? Someone wants to manipulate the financial statements. Mm -hmm, guys, is the auditor. What do I, what, what do, I do? Is the auditor. Someone wants to manipulate. I have to maintain professional skepticism throughout the what? The audit. Don't just believe information at its face value. You need to be skeptical. You need to be alert to everything that they are doing. You, when you look at the PPE, don't just say it's correct. Look for the evidence, sufficient appropriate evidence. You understand? Intangible assets. Is it correct? The event, is it correct? Gather evidence, you understand? So the response we are just saying, maintain professional skepticism throughout the audit. That's what I'm saying. What is professional skepticism? Professional skepticism is an attitude that includes the question in mind or being alert to conditions that may indicate possible misstatements, whether due to fraud and critical assessment of audit evidence. You understand? All right. So that's it. Um, that's the, the response. Then on the loan, guys, on the loan, what do you do? If I see the, the, that in the scenario that the company took a loan, it's a risk to me. You understand? The risk on the loan is on what would be your explanation. A company took a loan maybe of 10,000, that's a risk. And they're paying interest of, of maybe 10%. Why is it the audit risk? The risk is on classifying. They might not classify correctly, you understand? Like the interest loan, they can be treated as a, as a what? The interest alone, they can be treated as a non-current liability instead of current liability. You understand? That's the risk. Are you seeing that they will end up overstating the non-current liabilities and understanding, understanding the current liabilities? You understand? So that if the risk is on, is on classification, right? And also, guys, um, um, we can on the loan we, call, we can also have uh, like the things such as the covenants. So there are so there are loans with covenants. 
like for example, maybe the covenant was, was with the bank. Maybe you made a deal with the bank that, yes, we are giving you this money, but when you have problems, we will require uh, to, 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 to be repaid immediately. You understand? Uh, that, that's a, a covenant. Another covenant, maybe they will say, if your, if your profits uh, fall below this threshold, you, you, you are a risk to us, we require you to pay our money immediately you understand so the loans with covenants is a risk to the entity so the the explanation will be uh, or it will be that if the company um breaches uh, the covenant uh, you understand uh, they will be required to repay the amount immediately which will affect uh which will adversely affect its going concern going concern what status Remember, I have also explained about the going concern. You then continue that the going concern disclosures may be inadequate. You give a response on the going concern. You understand? Right. The inventory days, people, they, they, they don't also know that uh, the ratios, you can be given ratios to calculate on part A. Those ratios that you can be given, guys, they are also at risk. People, they don't know that. Someone will say, I have answered the, 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 the exam, but uh, only I identified five, five risks only. Guys, but they wanted seven. Uh, this exam was in fact, I don't think they, 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 we, we have seven in total. Not knowing that on part A, if you are given the ratios, those ratios are what are also at risk. So guys, if the today is also at in the, it's also an odd risk. Maybe you have calculated the prior inventory days and the current year. If there is an increase in inventory days, this is an odd risk. Why? It's an odd risk. Why? Because uh, it is, if, if the inventory is increasing, if the days are increasing, it's likely that the inventory you, you have been recognizing uh, in the financial statements may be what may be overstated. Why is that so? Because maybe your inventory will be out of what date. Now it depends on the scenario, it depends with the product that you're dealing with. Maybe some of the products, uh, maybe if it's fast paced industry, maybe it's, it's a company is dealing with the, the smartphones. You talk about the goods will be out of date. You follow, right? It's likely that the goods will be out of date. You understand? Like giving an example, um, iPhone 13 Pro Max was the latest phone, right? It was the latest iPhone. But now we now have 14, guys. So I assume that when, when we have 14, it means the 13, the price of the 13 is reduced. So if they do not adjust their financial statements, the, that in, the inventory is overvalued. That's what you're saying. So you're saying if the inventory days are increasing, uh, so inventory is taking too many days in inventory and there's a risk that it can be out of debt, out of fashion obsolescence. Or maybe there's a type of product that you can talk about, um, the, the, the goods may be damaged. And if they are damaged, we have to reduce the value of the inventory. If the NRF is lower than the cost, you apply IS2 inventory valuation. You understand? Yes. Guys, on the inventory, another thing also, um, uh, let me add before I, uh, I forget, uh, I can add number 10. When we have work in what progress, so let this be 10, let this be 11 and 12. The work in progress, guys, how do you know that there is work in progress? Maybe uh, they'll tell you that we have work in progress, or they'll talk about the product. Then they'll say, this product takes time to complete. So if, if it takes time to complete, like, it's likely that it's work in what? In work in progress. That's the only risk. What would be your explanation? Guys, your explanation would be way, work in progress is complex to what? To value. You understand? And, but that's not enough because you have to link what is it going to affect. Work in progress is complex to value. Therefore, there's a risk that the inventory may be what? May be overstated or understated. But, but guys, on this one, allow me to say over or under. Because if it's complex to value, we don't know that uh, what, we, what the, the value that you give was over or under. You understand? So that's why I'm saying there are some questions where you say over or under. There are some questions where it's not proper to say over or under. You get it? On the response on the work in progress, guys, work in progress, even if you remember the allowance for example, those are just estimate. Even if you also think about the work in progress, you can estimate the percentage, you understand? So the percentage of completion should be discussed with the management and assess the reasonableness of the assumptions used. Another response that I can give to reduce, um, another response I can talk about, um, do you know that uh, work in progress, uh, when we are valuing, we add the cost that we have incurred, right? You are manufacturing. Just know that when you are manufacturing, guys, we, we add the production over at cost, not the non-production. So another way to reduce the risk of valuing incorrectly, I will say, um, I will say on the overhead, I will say ensure that um, the company is only inclu included the production overhead costs. You understand? Yes, that's what you're saying. Uh, review the overhead calculation. 
and ensure that the non-production overhead costs have not been included. So I think I can explain differently. You don't need to claim, but you need to know. Right. That's it. Uh, we also have uh, the inventory days, the, the receivables days. Guys, the receivables days are increasing. The explanation is the same with the one, the, the one that I, I said on customer survey and trade days. The receivables days are increasing. It's likely that the, there are some customers who will not, will not be able to what to pay. Some will pay days. You, you use the same explanation, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, that's the inventory days. Now on the payables days, payables days, if the payables days are increasing, this means you don't have enough, enough cash, right? You're taking too long to pay your customers, to, to, to pay your suppliers, I mean. But what you have to understand is, on number 12, guys, on number 12, uh, on this one, we talk about the going what? Concern. But don't think that if the payables days are increasing, it's enough to talk about the going concern status, guys. You can't just talk about being the, the payables days are increasing, therefore the going concern of the command, guys. How can you talk about a going concern ju just because of the payables? You have to back up. Payables, if, if you are seeing on the scenario that we have payables increasing, we are, we are taking loans, we are struggling, understand? Maybe the profit margins are falling. You can combine this and you say it's an audit risk. Then you say there's a risk that they are not a going concern. So, um, and if a company is no longer a going concern, they must disclose that. So the risk is on them not disclosing it. You understand? So the, there's a risk that the going concern disclosures may be inadequate. I give the response. The same response that I gave you in the audit risk. That's audit risk. Yeah. 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 Yeah.